Hey guys, late last night I realized I made a typo in my outline and I had been saying someone's name wrong throughout this whole episode. The billionaire client of Jeffrey Epstein's was Leslie Wexner, not Leslie Wexler, like I called him in this episode. I realized it too late for us to re-record the episode and we didn't want to delay the show coming out. I'll get his name right going forward and hopefully everyone enjoys this episode. Thanks guys. Today we begin a series on Jeffrey Epstein. In part one, we'll discuss his upbringing and his mysterious rise through the business and financial world. We'll discuss his early jobs, how he came to make a fortune, and meet the people Epstein knew and socialized with. There's a lot of mystery and intrigue surrounding Epstein's life. Today, we begin to explore some of it. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you thought you recalled hearing Ian emphatically state that we would never do a show on Jeffrey Epstein, stick around. You did, because he did. But here we are. This is Necronomapod. This guy is big time. He knows people that know people that know people. Flight logs from his plane and his address book read like a who's who of some of the richest and most famous and powerful people in the world. Celebrities, actors, philanthropists, academics, and world leaders. It's really disappointing to look, as a lawyer, to look at this circumstance and say, how did this happen? One individual commits one abuse of a minor, in one instance of abuse of a minor, and they're held accountable for years and years through the criminal justice system. This individual abused hundreds of girls, and nothing happened. It's really, really unfortunate. We look at that and we say, how did the criminal justice system fail these girls in such a significant way? Dave, what are the uh, seven continents on this fine flat earth of ours? Oh, well, you sprung that on me. I don't know if I can remember <laughs> all of them. Let's see. North America, that's where we're at. South America, so that's America, but south of us. Yeah, they lost the Civil War. South America, dude. yeah, well, yeah, because <laughs> the North wins everything, right? Um, Antarctica is a continent, I believe. Uh, Europe, wow, Africa, Whew. he's named triple the amount I could name. <laughs> I think Asia, that's a big one, that's the biggest landmass yeah. continent, Asia. Yeah. So that's number six, right? Damn. One more, Man. what's the last one? Oh, Australia, we have some listeners there. Australia, oh, that's the last one. Wow. <laughs> It's a country and a continent. Yeah. It's a unique in that way. It's unique in that way. It appears some of our, our Australian listeners don't know that. Mm. As we took some grief and flack on the last episode, uh, Ivan Millette Part 2, I believe I referred to Australia as a continent, and they corrected me saying that it was a country, not a continent. Uh, really? It is, in fact, a continent. I, that, that was always my understanding. <laughs> yeah. Maybe things have changed. Like they have new math. They have new geography now. Like Pluto's not a planet anymore, right? Maybe they're just continent deniers. <laughs> they might be. <laughs> yeah. So then what continent are they a part of? Or they're just solo. They're like, they're like, uh, hmm. like, isn't it like Notre Dame is not in like a conference in hmm. like college football or NCAA. Maybe Australia is just like an independence. Like it's own little interesting colony country that doesn't associate and abide by the rules of continents maybe because they were a penal colony they have not been allowed to join continent dome i just don't think they know how to follow rules <laughs> is that what it is? Really? They, <laughs> they don't teach uh the the seven continents over there in their prison hmm. education system hmm. either way i just got a laugh out it's of it it's interesting you know i also heard a lot this week from people over the past two weeks that they don't really drink fosters in australia oh uh, well okay they're they're taking a piss I, They're I, taking a piss. Like everyone knows that's the only beer that's available in Australia. I don't right. know what these guys are talking about. <laughs> you can stop. You can literally Google it and it just pops yeah. right up. What's the favorite beer in Australia? Yeah. Foster's. Yeah. And in fact, a, it's the only there beer. is literally a picture of Crocodile Dundee doing the stone cold with two, <laughs> two of those keg cans of Foster's. Obviously. Like what the fuck are these people talking? I think about? that's on their flag too. A can of Foster's and Crocodile Dundee. Of course. Some, some shrimp on the Barbie. Yeah. And ACDC. What else is there? That's it. And, and then prison bars are across the whole flag. <laughs> All right. We, we, we had enough fun with them for two weeks. We were a little rough on them. Anyways, just want, I had a good laugh about that. Maybe they were just drunk and joking with me, misunderstood. But either way, I just wanted to clarify that I was correct. That what if you're wrong, content. Mike? What if, what if they're like, the fuck's this guy What if about? we've all just been taught wrong the entire time? Yeah. That, right, mate. We're not a continent. Yeah. 
But then I ask, are you just, you just ride solo? Are you just nothing? Hmm. I'm intrigued. Does Antarctica adopt you? You're like under their umbrella, <laughs> their domain. They also told me to stop doing my Aussie accent this week. So I'm going to do it even more now because of that. Just a spite. I think Aussie Dave is the best. I think she do the whole show in an Aussie accent. Right. <laughs> right, mate. <laughs> Oh, I know what I wanted to add, something that I, I had written down that we didn't talk about last week, the kind of a postscript to the Ivan Malat thing, is that his nephew ended up killing someone in that same forest later on. What a really? perfect yeah. content for the cool down show at the end of the month, Dave. Oh, we'll talk about it then too, but <laughs> a lot of people mentioned it this week and I go, you know what? I had that written down and we never, uh, we never talked about it. I thought it was interesting. His, it was his nephew? Yeah. Killed someone? How about that? I think it's safe to say that that whole family. No, we could do without them, I think. <laughs> okay. We don't really need them around. Except it, for, what was it, Boris? Boris. Yeah. All right. Well, let's dive into this. This is going to be something. Something, all right. So obviously this is just, this is all on me <laughs> for the fact that I said over and over again that we would never do this, and here we are. Yeah, here we are. Here we are indeed. <laughs> when I brought up this idea, it was like, because I know I said it on Heaven's Gate Part 3, and then the next week, I or the next day, I text you guys. I'm like, okay, here's here's how we can do it. Yeah, that was weird. Uh, <laughs> then we just had this discussion last night, right? But we can get around this without without talking politics because he associated with. I have my doubts, but please, we'll please continue. <laughs> he associated with everybody, like top physicists, scientists, people, and you know, all over academia. Harvard and even NASCAR to a small degree. A which, big portion of academia. Yeah. That's how people legitimize themselves when they're creeps like this. He has his tentacles and everything. And yeah. that's what you. That's what makes you untouchable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you, you look at people we're going to talk about here in this, the end, towards the end of this episode. And you're like, you, you don't know who was involved in what when you see him pictured with people. Like Stephen Hawking's a good example. We'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Like was Stephen Hawking up to this shit? So then, yeah, you got to try to differentiate who's involved. Right. Who knows what he's up to and who just, you know, because he's a big socialite and, you know, businessman and, you know, who's just buddies. Maybe we should just ask him. Like my homie, Lil Wayne says, get money, fuck bitches, get money. <laughs> Fuck bitches. See? <laughs> Stephen Hawking's always on demand. You can ask him whatever you want. <laughs> Who did it say like his homie? Like my homie Lil Wayne says, get money, fuck bitches. <laughs> so he was down with Jeffrey Epstein, I think. That's the American dream, isn't it? The North American dream, at least. I don't know what they do in the South American. Well, is it even a continent, Mike? I have to ask. <sighs> Not after the Civil War. <laughs> They submitted their continuity to us. <laughs> so Jeffrey Epstein was born January 20th, 1953 in Brooklyn, New York to Pauline and Seymour Epstein. He's the oldest of two siblings and his brother, Mark Epstein, is going to come up later in the story with regards to allegations and some connections with people. Eventually, the family moved to Seagate, Coney Island, Brooklyn. And this is where the family settled for pretty much all of Epstein growing up. And they ate Nathan's hot dogs at Coney Island and lived happily ever after. And that's what I would have been doing. Mm -hmm. Do you have to write that on all of your addresses? Seagate, Coney Island, Brooklyn, New York? I don't know. It's a good question. I would, never, I would never send mail ever. <laughs> <laughs> this was a working class neighborhood. Um, and the Epsteins were not wealthy people. Just your average hardworking family. His father worked for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation as a groundskeeper, and his mother worked part-time to make extra money as a teacher's aide. So she was basically like, I don't know, for the times, she was, you know, did all the household stuff, mm -hmm. taking care of the kids, but then she also had this job on the side for extra money. So not a lot of cash coming in. No, they're very uh, kind of on the border, that lower, like, lower middle class. Yeah. yeah. There's no denying that Jeffrey Epstein was an intelligent guy um, and his parents pushed education very early on, believing that education would be the way out of you know, the working class neighborhoods and that lower middle class. He began playing piano when he was five years old and he continued with piano through his time in school. He went to public schools and once in junior high, he attended Mark Twain Junior High School. 
he was extremely gifted in mathematics and skipped ahead two grades. Couldn't really find much on that if, they, if there was any alienation like in Ted Kaczynski and there was someone yeah. else we just recently talked about that had that. You know who's not gifted in math? Who's that? Mike Namapod. Uh, neither am I, so. As soon as someone starts talking about numbers, just know I've stopped listening. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't, I won't even listen because I just, it. I tune it out. At one point, when considering majors for college, specifically looked at Bachelor of Science because no math class was needed. And I was like, all right, we're going with a Bachelor of Science degree because <laughs> I'm not taking any more math. I was pissed I had to take one semester of like a biology or chemistry mm-hmm. and mm. I mean, at least the science part was OK, but chemistry gets rough with all that stuff. Chemistry's fun. I mean, it's OK, but you, you got to be good at math, too. Yeah, with that. You can make bombs. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> going to college, and I'm a major in bomb making. I did a presentation at our high school, Mike, on uh, how to make a bomb one time. Different times. How to build a home. How to build a homemade. Was it a smoke bomb? Might have been just a smoke bomb. Oh, okay. Nowadays, the school would be in That's lockdown right. as soon as you started talking. <laughs> yeah. The teacher would hit his little safety button under his desk. I know. Isn't Fucking that crazy? stormtroopers would come in through the windows <laughs> like in uh, the end of Christmas vacation. <laughs> and you'd be fucking leaving in zip ties. Probably right. That's that's still just a little scary that they let you do that. <laughs> yeah. some- I mean, this was only 40 years ago. All right. <laughs> That's so not too far what, off at this point. This was in the early 90s, right? Uh, late, late 80s. 80s. I, was, yeah, close I, I knew that. I was giving you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in there fucking talking about bomb making. That's, it was like scary. it was an English class, like a visual presentation of how to do something step by step. And I here's how you blow up a teacher's car. <laughs> I think I took something out of the old anarchist cookbook and <laughs> and I made it in class. Oh, man. <laughs> what was the English class that you had to do? This? I don't know, man. I, I'm pretty sure it was English. Mm. I think it was a smoke bomb, though. I didn't, wasn't going to make a detonation bomb or anything. I want to say it was a Still smoke bomb. Still not okay. Still not all right. <laughs> it's just crazy how times changed. Right? Not only are they changing long division on us, now Dave, Dave can't even give a bomb pre- <laughs> an innocent bomb presentation. <laughs> it's a long time ago, kids. So he, he was really gifted in mathematics. In 1967, he went to the National Music Camp, ran by the Interlochen Center for the Arts for his piano playing, which is a pretty big deal, especially coming from the neighborhood, you know, the the Mm. income level he grew up at. It's one of the highest profile art schools worldwide. In 1969, he graduated from high school at the age of 16 from Lafayette High School, and then immediately enrolled at Cooper Union College for Mathematics. In September of 1971, Epstein changed colleges and enrolled in the Corn Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University. He left in June of 1974 without earning a degree, which is a very important detail here, that he never got any form of a college degree, ever. But nonetheless... A few months later, in September of 1974, Epstein got hired at the Dalton School, located in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, teaching physics and mathematics. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) This is the first part where it's like, wait, how? Yeah. Bullshit artist. Do you think he lied on his LinkedIn profile? (laughs) (laughs) 1974 LinkedIn profile. (laughs) Dalton's a very prestigious school. That, from my understanding, looking at their website, it's like a prepping school for students to get ready to attend Ivy League schools. So, because it it teaches kindergarten through 12th grade. So, if you know that you're going to be sending your kid to Harvard, or in, yeah. you know way back then, this would be the school they go to, to to achieve that, I guess. Well, Mike, you and I attended a pretty prestigious prep school. So, you know, we're no slouches here. I can assure you uh, my family was not paying (laughs) $55,000 a year to go to school. Yeah, because that's how much it costs. That's the current enrollment for this upcoming (sighs) year. What we paid for me to go to that school is absurd, like, amount of money. You know what the tuition is today, this year? It's going to be at least double what I paid, I think. seventeen five. That is $10,000 more than it was when I was there. And I was there in the early 2000s crazy so in 15 plus years 17 five holy fuck yeah 
And your day, it was what a quarter and a loaf of bread. <laughs> <laughs> you brought once a week when the oxen drops you off at school. That's right. <laughs> uh, our parents did not send us to our school to prepare us for Harvard. Speak for yourself, buddy boy. <laughs> but no, probably not. It's not entirely clear on if Epstein lied his way into teaching at Dalton or how exactly he was hired. Here's where we're going to get the first piece of Epstein's web that grows across the political world. It's something that people point back to when we talk about some stuff in part three. The headmaster at Dalton at the time was Donald Barr, father of William Barr, who was the United States Attorney General under Donald Trump from February 14th, 2019 to December 23rd, 2020. He was also uh, Attorney General under George H.W. Bush back in the early 90s. Really? He, mm -hmm. yep. And I guess from what I was reading, Donald Barr, William Barr's father, is known to have made some questionable decisions regarding hiring while he was headmaster at Dalton, but it's not clear if he was directly involved in hiring Epstein or not. You would think there might be a record of something with him being hired, but <laughs> there there isn't any. Mm. Donald Barr left Dalton about three months after Epstein was hired. And from there, Epstein was promoted to teach a more exclusive set of students. Again, it's not clear if he was just lying his way through all of this. It's pretty muddy as to how all of this happened. The ability to bullshit people is often more important than your actual credentials. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I agree. Through teaching exclusive classes, Epstein was introduced to a guy named Alan Greenberg, who was the CEO of investment bank, securities trading, and brokerage firm Bear Stearns. Alan Greenberg didn't become the CEO until 1978, but he did have hiring power at the time that he was introduced to Epstein. In 1976, Greenberg hired Epstein as a low-level junior assistant to a floor trader, so he was just a, a floor trader's assistant, just helping this guy out. So no reports of any issues at the school while he was there? Nothing like we're going to get into later? There, There's a little bit of some rumblings, okay, but nothing, nothing like really concrete or even... Mm -hmm. So he wasn't fired for it. He left on his own accord mm -hmm. for this next opportunity. Yeah. Just kind of always stumbling upwards. Yeah. I think so far. Like dropping out of college to becoming an exclusive teacher at Dalton, Epstein quickly rose through Bear Stearns and became an options trader in the special products division. Not long after this promotion, Epstein was promoted to advising Bear Stearns' wealthiest clients on tax strategies, including Seagram president Edgar Bronfman, who we remember is the father of Claire and Sarah Bronfman, the two women who funded Nexium. The knee pad cult. Yes. In volleyball. Yeah. In so, dad Velcro shoes. <laughs> fuck that ass. The coolest. <laughs> I mean, and here it's safe to assume he the guy doesn't have a CPA because he doesn't have a fucking degree. Right. But here he is doing tax strategy advising. For someone like Edgar mm -hmm. Edgar Bronfman. What um I, I should have asked this before. Why did he not get his degree? Did he just decide like because he seems really smart. Was he bored with just the college experience? Yeah. So from everything that I was reading, he seemed like a guy that just couldn't sit down for one one subject and just focus on that one thing and yeah. just kept bouncing around. And hmm. not everyone finishes college, Mike. Yeah, no. And that's, that's why <laughs> like he's just but he was already there on his way. And. I don't, I don't know what the issue was. Yeah, he was on the path. You always meet, you know, you meet a ton of people who are just extremely smart. They don't have a college degree. You don't need a college degree to be successful. Like in life, Bill clearly. Gates dropped out of Harvard, Mike. He never finished. Yeah, that's my point <laughs> that I'm trying to make here. I'm not shitting on the guy. I promise. It's just I was curious as to why he never did. If there was like a trouble or he just saw a paycheck and wanted to go chase that or if he was bored and, you know. You know who else never had a college degree? <laughs> Stephen Hawking. No, that's not true. He had lots of college degrees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, like I said, just a guy that couldn't focus on one thing for very long, just yeah. got bored. And Most of the smartest people I know don't have college degrees. That's no joke. After being employed at Bear Stearns for four years, Epstein was made a limited partner. But the following year, he was asked to leave after committing a Reg D violation. 
I tried to read this. A oh, lot securities of law. I tried to read that over and over again. I'm like, I really, I, I get that a crime or something happened here or an issue, <laughs> but I don't understand what that issue was. That's like someone putting in front of me. If Dave was traveling 25 miles an hour on a road and was driving for 30 minutes, how far did Dave go? <laughs> Fuck it. I don't know. I, whatever. I give up. I quit. <laughs> So Reg D has to do with the the rules around allowing exemptions for smaller companies to sell securities without registering them with the SEC. Essentially, I, I got know, bored I don't know. while he was. I don't know. Know. So I was, can you I read that know. one more time, please? <laughs> yeah, like when you're going public and you want to sell these securities, you have to register with the SEC, and it's a whole process, an expensive process. Reg D, you can it's a like a private security sale without registering the securities you're going to sell. And so he and, I, and I can't go in any further than, you know, I can't yeah. explain in depth, but that's essentially what it is. And he not to be confused kind of- with Reg D from the Federal Reserve, which limits your withdrawal, the number of times you can make withdrawals in your savings account. That's also Reg D. Uh, different Reg D. Different Reg D. <laughs> Mike's Reg D in college was, you're going to take my D and <laughs> that's it. Please. So <laughs> can I'm- we have a, a new T-shirt that just has the Reg D and the actual uh, like just definition of what it is. <laughs> and then underneath they're just like Necronomapop. Let's see how many of those we sell. <laughs> you know, we have enough stupid serial killer stuff. Right. Let's have like actual some some rules and laws here from the some financial laws. Yeah. <laughs> just a very, random very shirt. exciting stuff. <laughs> I literally in the one sentence he read, I tuned out and like, I was <laughs> like, wait, what did he just say? I it was oh I suck. So he so as a as a guy that would be handling all that like tax information and stuff like that, he explain one more time. What did he, what did he do wrong? Or what could he have done wrong? I guess. Yeah. I, he know. violated reg D. Okay. okay. There's <laughs> lots of provisions of reg D that he could have, you know, violated. So I, I he fucked up something. He fucked Ian up and I something. are going to sit back. Dave, would you read the provisions? <laughs> Clearly, the guy's a problem following the law. So, I mean, it could have been a number of. (laughs) This is the the least of his concerns. (laughs) Dave's going to filibuster the podcast and read the Reg D violation in its entirety. (laughs) Even though he was asked to leave Bear Stearns, Epstein stayed close with bank CEO Jimmy Klein and former CEO of Bear Stearns, Alan Greenberg. Epstein also kept money to some degree associated with Bear Stearns until Stearns collapsed in 2008 in the whole uh, financial crisis. Yeah, I remember those days. Bear Stearns was a heavy hitter when when they collapsed and Lehman Brothers collapsed and uh, that was not good. I don't think people realize how close we were to a global depression back then. Yeah, I don't even... Right on the edge. Like, it could have been really bad. I mean, it was really bad, Yeah. But- so in August of 1981, Epstein founded his own consulting firm, Intercontinental Assets Group Incorporated, which was like a bounty hunter in regards to money. Epstein would recover stolen money for clients who lost that money from fraud committed by brokers or lawyers. There's evidence that he was at least successful with one of these clients, He helped a Spanish heiress recover millions of dollars that her father had lost in fraudulent investments. I mean, this is just shady from from go. (laughs) (laughs) This guy. A bounty hunter for money. (laughs) (laughs) To friends, he described what he did at this time differently. And this is kind of where the mystery, like you said, it's getting shady right off the bat. This is when the mystery starts getting deeper. Some of his friends said that he told them that he was helping governments get back embezzled money while he told other people that he was consulting those governments and wealthy people in how to actually embezzle the money. In some instances, he told friends that he was an intelligence agent. It's not clear if he was telling people that he was from the CIA, FBI or something else, but he was telling people that he was an intelligence agent. So there was a book that came out in 2019 that states that he and Ghislaine were Mossad agents, like high level Mossad agents, or at least he was. So that's pretty crazy. Yeah. That's the Israeli intelligence service, the Mossad. So that's I, I like we were talking about in the beginning. I think that might be like the biggest thing with me about this is that the mystery of who is this fucking guy. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of smoke to this claim of his. 
During this time frame, Epstein used an Austrian passport that had his photo, but a fake name. I don't know if that fake name is sealed in some court documents, but I couldn't find the name that was used on that passport. I found it. Did you? Yeah. Cunty McCuntlips. God damn it. <laughs> That's I not hate it. when I get excited. He's so happy. <laughs> he just ruined his night. I'm sorry. What a dick move. <laughs> I saw him perk up. I go, oh, shit. <laughs> it's just a bad joke, homie. Damn. <laughs> um, and this passport was presented in later court cases that we'll, we'll talk about in part three, but... Um, this passport also listed him as living in Saudi Arabia. So he's all over the place here. Austrian passport says he lives in Saudi Arabia. So this is another Claims to be cunty McCuntlips. I mean, <laughs> it all adds up. This is another one of those Charlie Day on the wall with like the, <laughs> the board trying to figure out and the lines going everywhere. Yep. Figuring out where the fuck this conspiracy goes. Yeah. Also during this time frame, one of Epstein's proven clients was a Saudi Arabian businessman named, I'm going to try my best, Adan Khashoggi, Adan Khashoggi, who was the middleman between transferring American weapons from Israel to Iran as part of the Iran-Contra affair in the 80s. Khashoggi was one of numerous weapons defense contractors that Epstein knew. Iran-Contra worked out pretty well for Reagan, didn't it, Mike? I'm not going to get sucked into your political debate, Dave. <laughs> Stay tuned for Dave's upcoming 12-part series on the Iran-Contra conspiracy. It's a hell of a story there. It's just going to be him ranting for 12 episodes. <laughs> well, I don't recall that. <laughs> the Reagan defense. I don't recall. In the mid-80s, <laughs> Epstein used that passport to travel multiple times between the United States and Europe, and Southwest Asia. While in London, Epstein met a guy named Stephen Hoffenberg, who was the CEO of Towers Financial Corporation. Sounds like a fake name to me, but... <laughs> Stephen Hoffenberg? Yeah, come on. <laughs> uh, better than that. <laughs> <laughs> these two met through a guy named Douglas Lease, who was one of these defense contractors that Epstein knew and another guy named John Mitchell, the former U.S. Attorney General. So that's why, that's like right away here, we got defense contractors. He knows people that are transferring weapons. It's all connected. Government finance and uh, defense contractors. Yeah. War for profit. It's all connected. So after meeting Stephen Hoffenberg, Epstein ended his firm, Intercontinental Assets Group, and was hired at Tower Financial Corporation. The Towers was a collection agency that bought debts that people owed to like hospitals, banks, and phone companies. Hoffenberg gave Epstein a very luxurious office in Manhattan and paid him $25,000 a month. That's a lot of money back in the 80s. Yeah, so 25k in I would take that money right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <all right>. yeah. <laughs> Can't afford to live in New York City with that, but that's probably 50 to 60k in today's money. So a nice chunk of change. Together, Hoffenberg and Epstein start buying large stakes in corporations in an attempt to take over the companies by having enough shares to outvote board members. This had a specific name, but I can't remember. It was like... Hostile takeover? Something like that. In 1987, they unsuccessfully attempted to take over Pan American Airways. And then in 1988, they tried another unsuccessful attempt at Emory Air Freight. So it doesn't seem like they're very good at it. No, they were not. <laughs> <laughs> Working the kinks out. They'll get there. Yeah, okay. Give them time. Well, let's wait and see then. Yeah. You got to lose a few before you can win the big one. That's good advice, Mike. Yeah. You should put that on like one of those motivational posters <laughs> hanging in the office here. I just hear it in every sport ever. You got to lose a championship before you know how to win one. Fair enough. At least enough. that's what losers tell themselves. <laughs> you know who's never told himself that? Tom Brady. He hasn't had to. <laughs> The, I, knew, I knew that was coming. The guy's going to have to start putting his, his rings on his 10-inch dick because he's running out of fingers to put it on. <laughs> Just saying. Whatever. Greatest of all time. I want people coming out of this episode thinking I'm a bigger heel than Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> the following year, Epstein just abruptly left Towers Financial. And this is where some people believe Epstein made a great deal of his money. Through the time Epstein was with Tower, Stephen Hoffenberg had been running a Ponzi scheme. Still, I'm not completely sure what a Ponzi scheme is exactly. I tried to read that a lot. 
I get a pyramid scheme. And these financial ones, they just do the, a lot of times they do fake statements. So they'll take your money mm-hmm. and they'll create fake statements for you. And then the next group of people like under you, they take their money and use it to pay themselves and the original investors to show a profit and just keep going down the line. But eventually, you know, it dries up and the jigs up. Okay. So you got to get out of it at a certain point. Yeah. And flee the country. (laughs) (laughs) They're not really investing your money. They're spending your money and then taking the next sucker's money to pay back the original sucker's money. So they don't realize that they're having all their money stolen. Gotcha. So Epstein was never charged in relation to the scheme, but Hoffenberg said that Epstein was 100% involved. Hoffenberg said, quote, the guy is a genius and he has no moral compass which to Hoffenberg, this was made Epstein the perfect guy for to work on this scheme with them. Yeah, right. That's, that's a <laughs> guy is a genius and has no moral compass. <laughs> Goddamn. That's who I want on my team on the stock market or whatever. I guess. Goddamn. I don't know. Those are scary words. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Hoffenberg ended up pleading guilty in 1994 to defrauding investors of $450 million dollars and served 18 of the 20 years he was sentenced to federal prison. There's no concrete evidence that Epstein was involved, but in 2018, former Tower shareholders felt that they had enough evidence to file suit against Epstein for his role. And in a separate 2018 case, Hoffenberg testified under oath to Epstein's involvement. That was the biggest fraud in U.S. history at that point, up until Bernie Madoff came along. Yeah, that's what I was reading. It was enormous. I mean, that's a lot of fucking money Mm -hmm. to scam people out of. Madoff died this week, actually. Really? A couple days ago. How about that? Pour one out for your homie? (laughs) No, not that fucking clown. Mm -hmm. Take that fucking drink and put it back in. I fucked a lot of people. Well, so have I, but (laughs) you don't hate me. (laughs) So that's that's the first theory out there is because it's still i mean we'll talk about it but it's not concrete as to where he got all the fucking money that he had Uh, that's the first idea like we said epstein left tower in 1989 but while he was still there in 1988 he started his own financial management firm called j epstein and company which i was trying to figure out if he did that like behind hoffenberg's back Mm. Like if he would have been allowed to do that while he was working at Tower and he just did this on his own or what, but I don't know. Generally not something they're going to let you do. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Unless it's like, hey, I'm helping you defraud all these people. Uh, just FYI, I'm going to start my own thing too. Okay. Like, eh, 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 okay. You know, just had him by the balls type right. thing. Blackmail. Epstein would tell people that he only took on clients that were worth $100 billion or more. Uh, there's store, there were stories out there. You look at um, like n- magazine articles or news articles or something that did stories on him, like financial mm-hmm. magazines and stuff. There'd be people t- telling stories of uh, there was a f- client that had five hundred million dollars and Epstein turned him down. And you're not a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody just rolled with this. Like this was like, oh yeah, sure. And the guy only works with billionaires. You create your own reality, man. It fucking works sometimes. Yeah, and his his reasoning back then in an interview that I read was that he was the only person around bold enough to say something like that. So that's why that's one of the reasons that billionaires worked with them. Nuts. That's 30 years ago, a billionaire. So, you know. Yeah. There's only one publicly known billionaire who Epstein had as a client, and that's Leslie Wexler. Wexler is the chairman and CEO of L Brands, currently operating Bath and Body Works, Victoria's Secret, and Pink. He also previously operated brands like Lane Bryant, Abercrombie & Fitch, Express, The Limited, and many more. There's a long list of retail things that this guy was CEO of. and He owned the upper walkway of every mall. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> The upper terrace, I guess. <laughs> sure. You know what Victoria's secret actually is? What? That when you get home, you're not going to look like any of the models who you got <laughs> when you purchase God stuff damn. at the store. Damn, pal. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Ouch. That's the secret. <laughs> I always thought pink was... 
like a brand that they sold in Victoria's Secret. Yeah, it's like on the side or whatever. Yeah, but I guess it's its own little thing. It's yeah, it must be its own entity. Hmm. I've never been in a Lane Bryant. I know they exist. I've never been. It's like the place you walk by and just look in, and then you're like, oh, okay, I'm gonna keep on going. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't need a a woman's business suit. Yeah, that's what they saw. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Some I don't know. Like well, I think women's professional clothing, and I don't know. I have never had a need for that. Well, you were in Abercrombie buying those hundred dollars sweatpants. We know, <laughs> well documented. <laughs> I preferred Hollister at the time, but I'm um, like American Eagle was good because that was much more uh, affordable. affordable. <laughs> and I've also they, they were I, I don't have them on now. I have two pairs of sweatpants. I believe they're American Eagle that I bought in high school that I still wear to this day. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Well, Hollister had the live cam of Laguna Beach, right? That's what made their store yeah, cool. Yeah, on the big wall. Yeah. yeah. But whenever I think of Hollister and Abercrombie, I just think of the just this that disgusting cologne smell. Oh, I like the Abercrombie cologne. But it just like wafts out into the rest of the mall. Like I'm trying to eat this yeah. fucking Annie Ann's pretzel. I don't need to smell like a male model in this eight pack abs <laughs> as I take every bite. <laughs> Remember they used to have the live model stand in front of the store? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you guys ever see that? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the, the Strongsville mall, they would have like, like uh, the dude and the girl like standing in front of the store, like with whatever they were wearing that day, like they wanted really? you to buy yep. and you walk by, I'm fucking, you know, elbow deep in cheese sauce from any <laughs> hands with my, my Jeff Gordon NASCAR hat. And I'm like, I could kick your ass pussy. <laughs> and he like makes a move and I flinch and run away, and go to the bathroom and. Jerk off thinking about the chick he was standing next to. Mike's like, if I just sit ups, I'd look like that too. (laughs) Shove this pretzel up your ass, dick. (laughs) Yeah, make a move. That's what I thought. (laughs) I I said said this under my breath four stores down. (laughs) Kick your ass, motherfucker. (laughs) So Epstein first met Wexler back in 1986 through a mutual friend in Palm Beach, Florida. And within a year... Epstein had sorted out all of Wexler's debts. In 1991, Wexler gave Epstein full power of attorney that gave Epstein the power to hire people, sign checks, buy and sell property, borrow money, and really do anything in Wexler's name. People that are close to Wexler to this day are just like completely confused and floored as to why he would give Epstein that much power, basically give Epstein all the power. Yeah. Who would do that? Like everybody, like uh, I can't remember the financial person that was, that was talking. I was watching an interview with, but he was like, if you knew Leslie Wexler as like really knew him as a person, Mm -hmm. as a businessman, he would never do something like that. That would be like, you would never think he would do that, but he did. I mean, it just leads you to believe that he had a picture of you know, or something. He had the goods on him doing something. That's what people yeah. just don't behave like that. Right. Like fucking a donkey or something. <laughs> to give like, him that even to give you that kind of control over your personal if I business was, empire. If I was that wealthy, you can fucking have the picture of me fucking a donkey. Well wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like but I mean, you know Well that means it's something illegal. Though, right, right. Which yeah. that's what it leads me to believe. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that Mr. Wexler was involved in anything <laughs> illegal by any means. I'm just yeah. uh, theorizing. If you were in that situation, it would take an illegal photo for you to hand over that kind of power. <laughs> Correct. To Mr. Epstein. That's exactly what I was trying to say, Mike. Thank you for clarifying. That's why I have a law degree. <laughs> you, know, you don't need for a law degree? What's that? An education in math. <laughs> that's, yeah, I guess that's true. I so, don't really have a law degree. I'm pretty sure people <laughs> who listen to the show know that. Oh, they know. Wexler has spoken out against Epstein you know, in recent years, in the past couple of years. But um, he says that he was just taken advantage by a con man or taken advantage of by a con man. He doesn't give much of an explanation other than that. Uh, I mean, I guess which that could be true because there's you also I don't know if, you know, you don't have that business sense and rise to that much power and have that fortune being taken by a con man. I mean, unless there's more, you know, and there's probably more, you know, there's a ton more to Epstein than we don't. No, but I don't buy that. I don't buy it with Wexler because he's on a different level of wealth. Right. That's than, what I meant with yeah. Wexler. I don't buy it. There's a lot of people that said Epstein would was super manipulative and could talk you into anything. Clearly. A lot of people point to the possibility of a sexual relationship between Wexler and Epstein that they were actually hmm. like Wexler was in love with him. Okay. 
That could explain it. Love and will make you do crazy things. Epps just <laughs> exploited him for it and yeah. said, like, oh, I love you too. Like, we need to show me you love me type thing. It, it could be. And mm. yeah, Epstein was asked about that in the deposition. So we'll talk about next week and the week after. Wow. Okay. And he, uh, if anybody's watched that Netflix documentary or you can look up the depositions, he pleads the fifth the whole time. He doesn't answer a fucking question ever. Yeah. The most he says is I would like to answer that. Claire, I would really like to answer that question, but <laughs> based on my lawyers, whatever, yeah. Because they start pissing off. This is one that was one of the questions that pissed him off was when he asked him. He was like, you know, are you bisexual? Did you have a relationship with Leslie Wexler? It's an interesting angle, huh? There's still more to Epstein and Wexler's financial relationship. Um, but in 1991, around the same time as he got all this power from Wexler, this is around the time that Epstein is thought to have met Ghislaine Maxwell. We'll be right back. Is there something interfering with your happiness? Something keeping you from achieving your 2020 goals? Let's face it, these are certainly trying times. From being cooped up inside your home to wondering how you're going to pay next month's bills, we're all experiencing some form of stress or strain on our mental health. And for that, BetterHelp is here for us. BetterHelp is an online mental health provider that will assess your needs and match you up with your own licensed professional therapist. The best part? No waiting rooms. That's a pretty big deal if you're as impatient as I am. BetterHelp is a safe and private online environment that will have you communicating with a counselor within the first 24 hours. And once you've begun, you can send your counselor a message at any time, always getting a helpful response in a timely manner. You even have the ability to schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all from the comfort of your very own couch. BetterHelp is available worldwide and has a broad range of expertise available, including licensed professional counselors who specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflict, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're currently recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Not happy with your counselor? No worries. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches and makes it easy and free to change counselors if needed. Remember, everything you share with your BetterHelp counselor is completely confidential. And while it's not a crisis line, it is a convenient, professional, and affordable way to seek the help you deserve. Financial aid is even offered to those who qualify. Want to hear how BetterHelp assisted people just like you? Check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. Look, we here at Necronomapod want you to start living a happier life. So, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash necro. Join over 1 million people already taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, better H-E-L-P dot com slash necro. So, getting to Ghislaine Maxwell, which I really like her name. Ghislaine, mm -hmm. big fan. Yeah, like I like the way it's spelled too. I, I'm not a fan of that. And then it's pronounced Ghislaine. I like it. Well, the S is silent. Yeah. Kind of like Mike when he had to do that shout out for the new patron last week. Put the lips. <laughs> <laughs> silent S. Put the lips. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Mike Tyson version better. Just saying. <laughs> Pussy lip. <laughs> <laughs> Suffering succotash. <laughs> Pussy lip. Not to be confused with uh, Jizz Lane in the hallway outside Mike's <laughs> frat house bedroom. <laughs> it's the alternate pronunciation. They did call it that. Jizz Lane. They also call it the Boulevard of Broken Dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Ghislaine was born December 25th, 1961 to Robert and Elizabeth Maxwell. Ghislaine was their youngest daughter of nine children, and it has been widely reported that Ghislaine was her father's favorite child, and he gave her special treatment, which some of it was good, like babying her, but then some of it was very controlling. For example, her father didn't allow her to bring boyfriends home or be publicly seen with them, like into after 18, or she should be able to oh, okay. do something like that. Yeah. Robert Maxwell ran the Pergamon Press Publishing Company out of their 53-room mansion in Oxford. He also ran a company called Mere Group Newspapers, which we'll get into that one in a bit. 53 rooms, is that all? 
I don't even know what I would do with all that space. I was meant to live that lifestyle. I fucked up somewhere. Yeah. I would have been good at that. <laughs> You'd have been good at being, <laughs> being very wealthy. The Downton Abbey shit where they dress you in the morning and yeah. brush your hair at night. <laughs> I'd love that. All right, I'll take the 53 rooms. I get the fuck out of here, people. Like, I'll have a guy come in and vacuum if he wants. Like, I take that. Don't dress me. Don't touch my hair. I believe there's some crumbs on the table after I've eaten my grilled cheese sandwich. Shouldn't you be grilled brushing cheese. those? <laughs> eating a grilled cheese. <laughs> All right. You wouldn't know what a grilled cheese was if you lived in a 53 room mansion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there in my 53 room mansion eating spaghetti. <laughs> I, I have an entire room in my 53 man room mansion that's just spaghettios. You can't even open the door. It's just a spaghettios. The butler's in the back of the room just rolling his eyes at Mike <laughs> as he's eating. Brings me a tray. With the spaghettios can is open with a spoon. <laughs> I'm like, uh, sir, this is not with meatballs. I asked for with meatballs. <laughs> Fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> There's literally nothing that would change about me if I got a lot of money. I don't think. I would just have a lot more stupid shit. Yeah. I would still wear wrestling shirts and wrestling or plain t-shirts. How many wrestling shirts have I bought in the last two yeah. two months that I've told you guys about? You know, yeah, get a little extra true. income and I'm just like, oh, let's see what wrestling shirts are on site. <laughs> Fucking bought a $55 Bret Hart t-shirt. I bought two Stone Cold Steve Austin shirts the other day. Bought a Stone Cold Steve Austin gift box the other day. This guy's living on the edge over here. Yeah, and that yeah. Ringmaster shirt is sweet. I can't wait, wait to start rocking that one. <laughs> Fucking I would have cut t-shirt. I would have a driver. Yeah. I don't like to drive yeah. anymore. Yeah. Also, you like getting drunk. I like to drink all day, so I would need the driver. And I would have a sushi chef, chef on staff. What, what about just a chef, though, in general? And he can do sushi like well. Yes, as long as you can make good sushi. Yeah. Because you want to be able to cook everything. Yeah. yeah. So a chef and a driver. That's all I would want. It's probably the two most important things. Yeah. I like to eat and I like to drink all day. So I just need someone to drive me around. Yeah. I could do the driver. Yeah. I hate driving. Yeah. That's all I need. And you need to get like, like your car would have to be like one of those limos so that you can drink in the back while they're driving you legally. That's how I would want it. Like, I want to be able to legally get drunk in the back of the car while you're driving me as well. Oh, I drink in a car all the time. I don't care. Yeah, but I want legal. <laughs> I don't want to have to not worry. That's a silly law. I don't want to abide by that. Well, there's no reason a passenger in a car shouldn't be able to drink. I don't disagree, <laughs> but my point is I want to be able to do it with recognize no that. worries. Yeah, you're fucking Australia over here. Yeah, I don't recognize that. <laughs> Dave, do you know why you're appearing before the court? No, I absolutely don't no. because I do not recognize this law. If I ever get the ticket, I'll pay it. I don't care. No, I want I want a limo so I can party in the back. Put up the, a limo is a little silly. I just like a big but you can't, Tahoe. I don't need a limo. But you can't legally drink in the back. A big Escalade. You still legally can't drink no in the back. No one's going to stop. Have you ever been stopped? Have I ever been stopped by the cops? Yeah. Yes. I mean, for like drinking in the passenger seat? I never have. Mm. Oh, that's a good question. I, ha I don't think I have. Still, I don't want that problem. Like, <laughs> buy a limo and you're fine. If you can afford a driver and a chef, paying a ticket for an open container is not a problem. That's I don't want true. those problems in my life. <laughs> I want to sit in the back of a big ass. <laughs> okay, limo. fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I think I would just, I would go to like every WrestleMania, sit front row. Of Dude, course. Oh, I, I would buy the WWE, obviously. I would just buy it. <laughs> and buy steak in it or no, I would just in. buy it from the McMahon. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, if we're talking Epstein Rich, yeah, fuck yeah. it. Do what you want. I'm not selling, Pally. <laughs> yeah, right. Everybody's got a price, Vince. <laughs> So Ghislaine was very well known in the London social scene, which I guess from my understanding is just a bunch of, bunch of wealthy people, whether they earned that money or it was handed to them like Ghislaine, they just like hung out. Oh, that sounds so great. I know. It sounds so much fun. Probably Amy Winehouse you can hang out with back in the day. Oh, I was being sarcastic. You were being for real about oh, it. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Just drinking in English pubs and eating fish and chips and hanging out. Sounds fantastic. I don't think they were hanging out in pubs, these people. No? They're like going to fancy stuff. That sounds even better. <laughs> <laughs> I'd do the pub scene. I don't know if I could do the uh, the British socialite scene. Mm. That sounds a little too hoity-toity for yeah. me. I don't want to get... Dave, you can wear a tuxedo, get all dressed up, go to this Yeah, thing. I don't like that part. Like, you know, I want to be fucking watching football in the bars, in the pubs, That's drinking what I'm a pint about. of yeah. Guinness. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. No, this this was all like hoity-toity. Yeah, I once pub crawled through London 
and it was amazing. I like, bet. It was just as stereotypical as you thought it would be. And it was fucking everything I thought it would. That's would very be. cool. Like we're, you know, we went to this one pub and uh, the fucking bartender's name was Mick. And he wore sweatpants and a dirty old T-shirt. <laughs> and he had a skullet. And he was just like an old fat man. And you didn't tip him. You just bought him another hard cider. Like really? he, would, he would have this little cup and you just you, instead of tipping, be like, oh, fill yourself up. And, you know, he would charge it to you. But that's just how you tipped him or yeah. showed you appreciation. And we would still leave him something at the end. Yeah. Uh, you know, and all it was was like couches with little round tables. And there was a fucking bulldog that just ran around the restaurant. <laughs> that, you would just come and sit on your lap and you could yeah. pet it. And, it, you know, it was friendly as shit. It was so much. That's fun. fantastic. Oh, it was the best. Ghislaine founded a women's club and was the director of the Oxford United Football Club, which was part owned by her father. So that seems like something that her father just kind of it's like, hey, put, yeah. put my daughter Here, in Here, go do something. Yeah. Football meaning soccer for our dumb American listeners. Correct. Stupid Americans. <laughs> fucking, I hate Americans. <laughs> We're so dumb. <laughs> After this, Ghislaine worked for a time as a magazine publisher for a publication called The European, which was owned by her father and believed to have been started just for Ghislaine to work at. <laughs> uh, father, I don't have anything to do. Could you buy a magazine and make me a publisher, please? <laughs> you imagine? Jesus. In 1986, her father bought her a yacht and named it Lady Ghislaine that was docked in the Netherlands. Ghislaine spent most of her time on the yacht throughout the late 80s and then went back to work at a new company in New York, which again was owned by her father. And this one, without a doubt, was made just for Ghislaine to run. She was given more responsibility in New York when in the beginning of 1991, her father bought the New York Daily News. So he basically set up this company to put her in New York and give her responsibilities to check in on the whole New York daily news thing. It's a sweet deal. If you can get it, if you're her. Yeah. I still just want that 53 room house. Just I just want to drive her and sushi. That's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we could just split a 53 room house and never have to see each other. This, this is also true. Yeah. yeah. Like you take a wing, you take a wing and you take the center and that's mm. it. Oh, if I could build my own 53 room house, like the hallways would just have urinals. <laughs> like every hundred feet, there's just a urinal. Yes, piss. There you go. <laughs> little little thing on the wall to put your beer on. Take a piss. Like how many? Every hundred feet. How big's the house? <laughs> Not sure how sanitary that would be. Yeah. Would be my initial. It's thought. my house. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, Fair well enough for me. Maybe I'll get the Larry David with like the little thing that comes down and opens back up. <laughs> Just want to be able to pee <laughs> conveniently whenever, always. Yeah. There's probably like 15 bathrooms in that house. That's not enough for him. When the urge hits him walking down a hallway, yeah. he needs a urinal right there. Like how many of those 53 rooms are bathrooms? Right. Well, everyone would have a bathroom problem. <laughs> oh, they have their own bathroom. In I would room. like to provide my guests with bathroom experience. But like if it's like my billiards room, then maybe I just need a urinal. Like there's no defecating in the billiards room. You just oh, okay. you have your piss and you go about your way. All right. Obviously, ladies are not welcome in the billiards room, so we don't need a toilet. That's what the gentlemen talk about politics and big game hunting and the latest whiskeys we've imported. In November of 1991, Robert Maxwell was found dead floating in the sea near the Canary Islands with the yacht, the Lady Ghislaine, in the water close by. Authorities ruled that his death was accidental, like he fell off the yacht, but Ghislaine has publicly said multiple times that her father was murdered, and there's some motive to make that, that a possible thing. After Robert's death, it was found that he was fraudulently moving pension funds from Mirror Group newspapers. That's the one we brought up a little bit ago. It has been reported that there were $440 million missing in pension funds, which affected around 32,000 employees. The Maxwell family was ordered to pay that money back to the employees. Uh, the government was also included in this too. Like the UK government, whatever. Is that parliament, right? Is that the parliament over there? Yeah, parliamentary system of government, sure. So it was it was like it was 
split up between government and the Maxwell family. Mm. Um, and two of Robert's sons were arrested in connection with the fraud, but they were later acquitted in 1996. Is everyone a fucking criminal? Like, is nothing good enough for these people? <laughs> like, you have more money than you could possibly ever spend. Yeah. Yet here you are stealing money stealing from more, working people. More, more money. These people can all just fuck off and die. I don't want to, like, generalize very, very wealthy people, but... But don't he's you have about, to? He's talking about the people in the story, though. The yeah, ones that are, yeah. But don't you like all the, these groups of people at this level? Don't you have to at least do a few shady things to get where you're at in that position? Yeah, probably. I don't know. Bill Gates. Mm-hmm. He seems pretty wholesome, no? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think Bill Gates is out fucking kids or anything. Yeah. <laughs> doing, well, doing he's not stealing money from working <laughs> people. The least right. we can say is we don't think Bill Gates is fucking kids. <laughs> That's a positive thing, right? Yeah. We'll put that in the pro column. <laughs> Does not fuck kids. <laughs> Gold star. You know what? That goes in all of our pro columns as well. See? You say about each of us. We're ahead of the curve. Yeah, we're good guys. Ghislaine officially moved to New York in 1991, shortly after her father's death, and right in the middle of her family being ordered to pay that money back. So it almost seemed a little convenient that she just took off to New York. Her father had set her up with a trust fund that gave her $80,000 a year. And the way that this was uh, financially structured or set up, however, whatever, uh, it wasn't, it wouldn't be affected by any of that fraud activity. So this money, he made sure that this money, this trust was clear of any of his criminal activity. Yeah, well, that was nice of him, sure. Swell guy. Not for any of the other kids, only Ghislaine. Oh, interesting. Fuck the rest of them. By 1992, Ghislaine was living in an apartment in Central Park with an Iranian friend and had already rose to be a prominent person in that whole socialite, you know, social scene of New York. Yeah, I was meant to be a New York City socialite, too. Yeah. Awesome. You were meant to be that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe a 53 room uh, apartment complex. Dave, overlooking that was like Central yours. Park yeah. on Park Avenue. Yeah. I would like that a lot. You could stand there every night with your whiskey overlooking the park <sighs> on your balcony. I would love that. Yeah. I love Central Park. I don't know, Dave. Did you just not meet expectations? I guess. Where did you go wrong? I went to that fancy prep school. I don't know what I did wrong. Mm. Should have followed with that Harvard education, maybe. Yes, I, I didn't get in. Maybe spending your time uh, doing presentations on how to make bombs and <laughs> stuff like that. Possibly. <laughs> As opposed to You like, might be onto something. You know, discussing the flaws in today's current political climate. <laughs> Reading the anarchist cookbook <laughs> instead of... <laughs> Yeah. The problem was he's you know being a little devil kid listening to all that U2. Mm. Yeah. Dave Matthews band. <laughs> and some 41. All those terrible <laughs> some 41. All those terrible devil I do like some 41. Yeah, they have the first album was pretty good. See? So like a lot of things with this story, uh it's unclear how Gulane and Epstein met and what their relationship exactly was. Stephen Hoffenberg, who went to jail for that Ponzi scheme, said that Epstein was introduced to Ghislaine sometime in the 80s through her father. The New York Times has reported that she met Epstein at a party in New York after breaking up with a boyfriend. There are also some speculation that Epstein met her through her Iranian friend that she was rooming with, and this would be more conspicuous spirity type thinking but based on epstein's connections to the middle east and that whole passport issue okay the nature of their relationship remains unclear as well it's been widely reported that epstein replaced uh that whole father figure in her life while she was grieving the death of her father uh, many of Epstein's employees have referred to Ghislaine as Epstein's girlfriend and called her the lady of the house Epstein has been quoted as saying Ghislaine was his best friend and Vanity Fair reported she basically ran Epstein's life like she organized everything for him. He's not that much older than her to be like a father figure, is he? Like it was like eight years, Mm -hmm. which I mean, I guess it's old enough, but it's not that much older. Like when you say father figure, I think that, you know, people tend to think older. That's what I thought initially. And then I looked it up and I was yeah. like, oh, it was only eight years. But, you know, her father just died. Yeah. So it's man. caught her in a var- vulnerable spot. So. Yeah. It's also through Ghislaine that Epstein met people like Duke of York, Prince Andrew. 
because she was real good friends with Prince Andrew. Oh, of course she was. Yeah. Prince Andrew seems like a player, huh? Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about Prince Andrew <laughs> in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> they see me rolling. <laughs> they hate him. <laughs> Back to Epstein and Leslie Wexler. In 1995, on top of having power of attorney over Wexler's money, Epstein was the director of both the Wexler Foundation and Wexler Heritage Foundation, along with the president of Wexler's property in New Albany, Ohio. This property is a $47 million mansion. And Wexler put a ton of money to build up New Albany, Ohio. Oh, oh and you can tell because it's fucking beautiful down there. Yeah. That is quite a spot. Epstein ended up making millions of dollars off managing Wexler's money and property. Also in 1995, Epstein renamed one of his companies the Ghislaine Corporation, which was based in Palm Beach, Florida. Not sure what they were up to with that, I would assume. <laughs> That's some type of money moving something. They were probably funding soup kitchens and food banks and things like that. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Before we move on further, get into some of the properties that were owned by Epstein from 1989 through 2016. Just to put into context, like how much money this guy somehow acquired through what we've talked about so far. It's obscene. And it doesn't make sense. I don't, I think that, well, I've ever talked about the mystery. It just, it makes no sense how he pulled all this off. But the largest house in Manhattan on 71st Street, that's worth 55.9 million. <laughs> A ranch in Stanley, New Mexico, worth 17.2 million. His West Palm Beach mansion, worth 12.3 million. A building in Paris consisting of seven apartments, worth 8.6 million. Great St. James Island in the U.S. Virgin Islands worth $22.4 million. Uh, not just a house. The, the island. <laughs> the island. And this is this, this next one is the big island. Uh, little St. James Island in the U.S. Virgin Islands worth $63 Because one island's not enough. Mm-mm. You have to have two islands. Do you guys, when, the, when Necronomopod eventually blows up, do you guys want to buy the island of Australia? <laughs> <laughs> I hear it's not a continent anymore. We can probably well, afford once it we now. own it, we can just denounce all continents, <laughs> give the people what they want. Okay, officially declare Fosters the official beverage of Australia, and we just run it as the Three Kings of Australia. <laughs> three Kings, all right. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. Urinals every twenty feet, <laughs> <laughs> and we promote fist fights with kangaroos because I love those videos. <laughs> I love videos of kangaroos, and I especially like when the kangaroos win because humans fucking suck. <laughs> All right, Australia, we're going to buy you. <laughs> You're going to love it. We're going to have so much fun on that island. It's going to be like Temptation Island, the show on Fox. <laughs> uh, Just for the drinking and sex everywhere. Pretty much how it is now. <laughs> yeah. But regulated by three kings. <laughs> yeah, okay. and, and again, I can't emphasize this enough. And urinals. <laughs> we're going to talk about those properties. You know, specifically, we'll talk about... Uh, the Manhattan, the the largest house there, um, the New Mexico. Pro- I mean, really, we're going to talk about all of them, actually. Um, but that's just an idea of what type of money we're talking about for the little bit we know already of what he's done as far as a career is concerned. And those are conservative estimates of his properties. Some sources value them higher. Uh, that was what the government the U.S. government was valuing them at. I will say about the Manhattan mansion, this was purchased and renovated by Leslie Wexler. And Epstein ended up later on, like a few years later, gave him $20 million for it. So like nothing close to what it was actually worth. Yeah. But it did give him $20 million for Which it. is interesting because I was reading an article that said they couldn't find any record of Epstein paying anything for it. Interesting. Yeah. Very so interesting. <laughs> we said interesting like 18 times in that <laughs> those sentences. I like, felt i had to uh, it was like a new york city real estate article so i don't know mm-hmm. maybe it was before and it's been updated but not the biggest fucking property in manhattan yeah the no records of and there's and there's <laughs> confusion as to the records yeah, of exactly <laughs> to say the least confusion now all of this stuff that, that we just listed 
isn't including another $332 million in assets like his art collections, planes and stuff like that. Uh, and multiple properties he rented, like there were office spaces in the range of fifteen to $20,000 a month. Put all those properties into perspective. Uh, then the other over 300 million in assets rent of 15 to 20,000. He also did a ton of philanthropy. And I think this was part of his grand plan because it muddies the waters even further as to who knew what and what he was up to when we get into part two and three. And, and I think this gives just more of an idea of the money that was being spent on top. Just, this is just charity stuff that's yeah. that's known it's not even the actual number starting in 1991 epstein began donating large amounts of money to academia and hanging out with top physicists and mathematicians he gave 850,000 to mit and at least 32 million to harvard for various reasons uh, from building dorms to funding a mathematical biology and evolutionary dynamics program whatever that is Eventually, Epstein established the Jeffrey Epstein Six Foundation, which funded science research and education. Notably, the foundation funded research at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. The true extent of his donations is unknown because tax documents show from 1998 through 2018, he only donated $30 million to numerous charities, which we know is not accurate. I mean, MIT came out and said, yeah, he gave us $850,000 or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, $850,000. And they've since, you know, backpedaled on that and have donated that to various things and stuff. You That's know. nice of them. And just on paper, that stuff we went through, unless he did all that on that Ponzi scheme, but still I don't feel like that adds mm -hmm. up to be able to do all that. Yeah. All I'm going to say is I hope that you provide us with answers. At the end of part two or three. Okay. It's my understanding that all questions will be answered in part three. <laughs> I want to know every fucking thing about this case, Ian. <laughs> and I hope you won't disappoint me. I hope you let us... Well, we'll save that for the part three. Never mind. <laughs> I retract what I was about to say. Notable people that are known to have associated with Epstein between the early 90s through 2018... Uh, Bill Clinton. Oh, uh, wait, come again. <laughs> I just picture Bill like, who? who's Jeffrey Epstein? Jeffrey who? <laughs> he doesn't sound like he's from Arkansas. I never heard of that cat. <laughs> Goes down with the ship, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shaggy defends every time. Uh, Donald Trump, Alan Dershowitz, Prince Andrew, Woody Allen, Stephen Hawking. Jeffrey and I used to tag team bitches all the time. <laughs> He's got a lot to say, uh, Stephen Hawking. I didn't know he was involved in this. Like Jeffrey and I used to say, two in the pink, one in the sting. <laughs> Perf. Can someone Stephen get Hawking. Stephen Hawking out of here, please? <laughs> He's drunk. Bring him back from the grave. <laughs> get him out of here. Oh, I thought you said get him on here. <laughs> no, I said get him out of here, please. <laughs> Clearly, he's in studio. Ian, we're looking at him right now. He's in studio with us. That's why he's talking at our microphones. Goddamn kayfabe. In kayfabe world, he's alive. Harvey Weinstein, Ted Kennedy, Courtney Love, Katie Couric, George Stephanopoulos, Chelsea Handler, David Blaine, Kevin Spacey, and Chris Tucker. And that's just the list that I have. I mean, there's tons of people, but I thought that list kind of shows just how far his tentacles yeah. go out into the world of just everything in society, I guess. There's a couple of uh, known abusers on that list. I was just going to say, this is a who's who of sexual allegations. Yeah. You have Harvey Weinstein and then magician David Blaine. You don't, there's no, nothing that at least I know of that I've ever read about David Blaine doing mm -hmm. anything bad. But it may, it raises, it makes you think and immediately you're yeah. like, okay, so what was David Blaine up to? Yeah, for sure. Guilt by association. But I mean, look at this, on. like Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Woody Allen, Harvey Weinstein, Ted Kennedy, Kevin Spacey off that list have all had sexual allega abuse allegations come up 
Yeah. You know, over the years. And that's I, maybe more have, but those are the ones that I know. Not Chris Tucker, though. That's why I didn't say him, Dave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you ever touch a black man's radio. <laughs> I love Chris Tucker. You got knocked the fuck out. <laughs> Friday, one of the best movies ever. Uh, maybe someday I'll watch it. <laughs> it's so absurd that you haven't it's seen this. Incredibly absurd. <laughs> it's never made the list. Jeez. Yeah, like I said, I just feel like that, just that little list just show, shows how far it went from, you go from Katie Couric to Prince Andrew. Yeah. Chris Tucker to Alan Dershowitz, who we remember him from OJ. That's, mm -hmm. I think that's the only time we've talked about Alan Dershowitz. Get into Epstein's inner circle because these names are going to pop up as we continue. Obviously, Ghislaine Maxwell, who we've talked about. Sarah Keller, who has used the alias Sarah Kensington and also goes by Sarah Keller Vickers being married to NASCAR driver Brian Vickers. What? <laughs> you sound like Bill Clinton now. There's no involvement in NASCAR in the pedophilia <laughs> community. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Brian Vickers was a big time driver for a, a, about a decade. You know, he was full time like 04 to 2014. Uh, Who did he drive? What kind of car did he drive? He drove his his big one when he first started, the one that I was a fan. He drove the number 25 GMAC Chevrolet. He drove for Hendrick Motorsports. He was teammates with my favorite, Jeff Gordon, at the time. And actually, back in his rookie year in 04, I met him at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. He said, what's up, bud, to me? Yeah. So I might be loosely connected to this. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I was I was 18, so he wasn't trying to traffic me in. He's like, my wife's got some 15-year-olds backstage. Would <laughs> you like to meet him? <laughs> um, yeah. He wasn't. He was good, but he wasn't great. He had, like I think, three career wins. He had to retire because of uh, he started getting blood clots. Mm. So he had to stop racing. I think his... He stopped altogether with NASCAR in 2016. Blood clots from sitting in the same position so long in the car every week? I don't know if it was related. It, it, I mean, that didn't help. That's why he had to yeah. stop. But yeah, I mean, hmm. you definitely, they tell you not to, uh, you know, not to take long drives if you're prone to blood clots or have blood clots. Yeah. For even two hour flight, you should get up and walk around a little bit. Right. Sure. Yeah. So, but anyways, yeah. So he was... And I think she, they married in like 2013 and he was full time in NASCAR till 2014. So there was about two seasons where, uh, you know, Sarah Keller was around NASCAR all the time. There's pictures of her at races and stuff. Yeah. And that would have been kind of right in the middle of what we're going to talk about yeah. in the next couple of weeks. Crazy. My and apparently now, I don't know if we're going to get to the follow up on them later, but they now own, he's like the head of the condo board in New York City where they live and nobody likes them because there's just all kinds of issues with like ongoing renovations and construction and tenants are complaining that all their money is going, you know, to that mm. and rents going up. So again, he's only got three career when NASCAR wins. <laughs> he's not affording a $10 million condo in New York City on his own. Interesting. There's a lot of people in this story that's like, how did you get all that money? In all fairness, he is a good looking guy. Like he's not like a, you know, what you would think as a stereotypical race car driver. He's a good looking dude, but mm. you know, thanks for that concise expert <laughs> NASCAR. It's not often I get to talk about I know. Look NASCAR at his eyes lit up. He's like, what? 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 Yeah. NASCAR. Yeah. It's like, I had no idea that was coming or anything either. And <laughs> I have his autograph somewhere. I had to find that. Send a little die cast for me. Yeah. Bring it in next time. Yeah, maybe. Show and tell. All right. <laughs> this is where the pedophile signed my picture. <laughs> Wait, I don't think he's been implicated at all. So he hasn't. I might want to retract that uh, statement. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He'll hear this and we'll be implicated. <laughs> so she was born in 1980. I couldn't figure out her exact birthday. I couldn't find it or much about her parents. You would think with some of these, like someone like her, you would be able to, she would at least have a Wikipedia page or something, but she doesn't. Mm. The only thing I could find out was that she was born in North Carolina. I mean, people that aren't born in North Carolina aren't legally allowed to be associated with NASCAR, are they? It's a fundamental rule of the... I mean, I think it's it's frowned upon if you don't marry a race car driver. <laughs> yeah. Let me look up. Uh, I got to see where Vickers was born. Remember, you can keep going. Sarah Keller was Ghislaine's secretary for over 10 years and has been referred to as a mini version of Ghislaine. She also worked closely with Epstein, pretty much as his secretary as well. 
she currently owns an interior design company called SLK Designs, going under the name Sarah Kensington. But there isn't really an online presence for SLK Designs. You get the NASCAR house package. They design your your uh, your living room in Confederate flags and checkered flags. <laughs> uh, Brian Driggers was born in North Carolina. There you go. I knew he was from the That's south. Weird. Of nowhere. Uh, also, Dave, I will not let you belittle the name of NASCAR. They have banned Confederate flags from all races. You're correct. They do not I, I allow stand that corrected. anymore. I apologize. That's all. <laughs> we can go back to mocking them. I, just, I will just clear up the Confederate flag issue. I was thinking more of like your carpet's going to be a checkered flag decor. Like the bathroom's like the yellow flag. Like caution. Ah, you know, be careful. That's a good one. That's be good careful. One. And also it blends in with the piss that's going to go all over the place <laughs> when you're drunk on moonshine because you're a NASCAR fan. <laughs> See, I can make the jokes, Pally, not you. <laughs> that's just how I can make Catholic jokes because I'm a Catholic. Same thing. Well, you were raised Catholic, though, but you're not a Catholic, right? The Pope has not excommunicated me, <laughs> to my knowledge, like, so I am still a Catholic, sir. Mm. I was baptized like, I was, and confirmed as was into I. the church, fella. As was I, but I went, through the, I went through the motions because you were supposed to. But I'm still like, I don't technically embrace Catholic. Catholicism. Well, that's your problem. I'm technically a Catholic. Can't take that away from me. You're not going to minimize me. Okay. If you want to be a Catholic, Dave, you can be a Catholic. I'm not going to take that from you. Like, it's the only thing that allows me to make fun of Catholics. Well, I, I think have the to fact that, that you were raised it gives you the understand. I mean, you understand Catholicism better than Catholics understand Catholicism. So, I, mean, I don't know. I always felt like religion is like you have to accept it to be it. You're not just it because you are it. Mm. Like, I, I don't, I'm not I see. I see what you're saying I here. Raised, I don't know that I agree. I was <laughs> raised Catholic. I'm not Catholic. Well, I think you are, unless you've been excommunicated. But I'm not Catholic. Like, it's a religion. You have to believe it. You have to be a part of it. Right? Do like, you? That's how I see it. I, I, I think we're talking semantics here. But yeah. like, as someone who was baptized and confirmed, I consider myself a Catholic still until the Pope does me the honor of excommunicating me. But I can't tell if you're being serious or joking right now. <laughs> I'm being like a little like of all. You're not, you're not Catholic because you, you're you not, obviously. And I think if you say, oh, I'm Catholic, people assume then that you are a Catholic. You're a practicing. I didn't say I was belief. a practicing Catholic. But, but, I am Catholic nonetheless. Mike, everyone eventually disagree. comes home to the church. But I disagree with that. <laughs> I think you have to be practicing to be it or at least accept its beliefs to be it. I think we're going to have to agree to disagree on this point here. That's fine. I mean, I don't feel that hot about it. I'm just saying. That's my thoughts. <laughs> Maybe we'll save this for an upcoming Bible babble. We'll have a debate on what makes you a part of other religions. Maybe we will. Yeah. I'm not going to invite you to the show, so you're not going to have a say. I've, I've upset you because I called you a non-Catholic and offended you as a Catholic. Like, you can't, you can't change what your heritage is or what your race is. Right. But it's a belief system. So you're in the belief system based on what you believe, right? I, I, that's I think that's I one way to look at that's it. That's how I see it, yes. Man, maybe so. I see your point, and I recognize and acknowledge <laughs> the validity of your point. I'm saying on a technicality, the thing that allows me to continue making is- jokes about the Catholic Church <laughs> is the fact that I myself am a Catholic. Can I tell and you I'm something? I'm going to cling to that. This conversation is too good to be giving away for free. <laughs> I challenge you to a Bible babble debate, Dave. <laughs> yeah! You will lose that debate, sir. I would absolutely lose that debate. We're going to start talking about the Bible. I have no fucking clue. You could sing your silly song. Oh, I would do that. Can I open the ceremonies with my song? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Anyways, Ian's like, come on, guys. I have a fucking story to tell. So there's not really a presence for SLK Designs Online. Uh, and it's not clear as to where the current business is operated. But at one point, it was out of a building in Manhattan owned by Epstein's brother, Mark, which is the same building where Epstein allegedly rented units to models, which we will talk about that in the next couple of weeks. The next person is Nadia Marchenko. She was born in 1986 in Czechoslovakia, who says that she was a model but it's not clear as to whether she's talking about while she was in Europe or when she moved to the U S and there really isn't any evidence of her being a model. She came to the U S around the age of 15 and it has been alleged in court documents that Epstein purchased her from her impoverished parents and just brought her to the U S 
she denies that, but that's what court documents say happened. What is confirmed about her career is that she was one of Epstein's main pilots, and she is the current CEO of AvaLoop. The website says, quote, Her career evolved from marketing through high fashion modeling to aviation. When Nadia was ready for longer runways, she became an aerobatic pilot, licensed flight instructor, and airline transport pilot, rated on multiple Gulfstream and Boeing aircraft. During her career in aviation, Nadia developed a thorough understanding of the industry and its demands. So that's no easy task, so. No, not at all. I'm going to copy and paste that onto my resume. That exact thing. Okay. (laughs) Her career evolved. (laughs) When Nadia was ready for longer (laughs) runways. Uh, Jean-Luc Brunel, he was born in 1946 in Paris, whose real name is Jean-Luc Ben Chumel. He is a scouter for models, being the former head of Karen Models and MC2 Model Management. He was Epstein's closest male friend. Karen Models. <laughs> I would like to talk to the manager. <laughs> this runway's too short. <laughs> and the other, then the last guy on this list of inner circle or people that are considered inner circle is Alfredo Rodriguez, who was Epstein's house manager and butler from 2004 through 2005. So you're telling me Brian Vickers was not part of the inner circle, but his Uh, wife was at one time. And unless him and his wife did not speak to each other at all Mm. in life. It's an interesting cast of international characters you've assembled here. Or that Jeffrey has assembled, not you. You did not assemble these people. (laughs) For years, throughout everything we've talked about, journalists and news organizations ran multiple pieces on Epstein. And those were all like financial publications you know the the only people that would care about him in the world but they were all positive and they all just took him at his word like oh the the mysterious jeffrey epstein who only deals with billionaire clients and he does all this great philanthropy work nothing no one ever bothered to look into anything about him then in 2002 epstein flew bill clinton chris tucker and kevin spacey to africa for an age charity it was on one of Epstein's private jets, um, and it was public. It was, you know, a, a very public charity, and there was pictures taken of all of them together. And that's when everybody, the, just the general media, was like, okay, so who is this guy with this huge private jet hanging out with Bill Clinton and just yeah, I'm sure <laughs> flying everybody over to, to Africa? Then the following year in 2003, Vicki Ward from Vanity Fair started really digging into Jeffrey Epstein for a piece titled The Talented Mr. Epstein. And that is where we will pick back up on part two. Wow. That's an interesting story here so far. More questions and answers, Dave. More questions and answers indeed. Don't think we're going to have very many answers at the end of this. Are you Mm. shitting me right now? (laughs) I think there's going to be a lot of uh, just a whole bunch of frustration and disgust and Hmm. going forward. And that's about it. Well, I I would like to say that I I suspect I know where part two is going. I I just want to say that pedophilia might not be such a bad word. You have pedal. Like I like to pedal my bike over to McDonald's to get a Big Mac. (laughs) Then you have philia. Like uh, Monica, get in here. I like to feel your mouth on my dick. So (laughs) it's two great words. Maybe not too bad. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> That's my homage to George Costanza with the ma- manure. manure. Ma, ma, which is good, and newer. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking when we were doing that. Uh, so what are our final thoughts? Part one. What do we make of this? I think it's a really good setup. Good background information on this fucking guy. Uh, I don't know. I don't really know this story, so. Curious this, to see where it goes. Ian, is this the last part where we have facts in a story and the rest is all speculation? Uh, no, we're, there's there's going to still be a lot of facts. All right. It's just going to be, a, I don't know about part three exactly. Part two is going to be pretty shocking, as mm. I say. You're telling people it's going to be a three-part st- series. Yeah. Because they're going to ask. Yeah. Yeah, I would say next week will be uh, shocking and disgusting. 
I think one. Wow, of, can't wait. <laughs> I think one of the thing. It, I think it was when I was texting you guys. Mm. One of the words I used was horrifying. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> assume it. That's exactly what it's gonna fucking be. So yeah. yeah. Which is why I was glad when you said we were never going to do this yeah. story. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I haven't been this interested in a subject in a while, so. Well, I'm glad we did it then. Well, and we'll see what the listeners think, right? In the end, it yeah. matters what they think. All I'm going to say is I expect Mike not to make any off-color jokes about, you know, distasteful subjects next week. I hope he shows a modicum <laughs> of respect in this, you know, storyline. and <laughs> looking around real confused. Yeah. <laughs> And I would expect that Dave will keep all of his political analysis to himself next week and the week after that and not, you know, divulge any of his political ideals on the listeners of this show. Oh, we got two more weeks to uh, to get through being good boys. I don't even know. I mean, the, as far as political, there's really not that much to get. I mean, we'll get into what Bill Clinton said and versus what reality is as far as going to the island. Yeah. Simply going to the island. Yeah. It's as much as we know. Right. A very kind quote from former President Donald Trump about how good of a guy Epstein is. But oh, that's, well, yeah, sure. That's an accurate and that, quote. And that might be his personal experience with him. Right. We don't know. Not not too much politics we're going to get into. We're just, we're just going to get into the cases, though. In the case of the... Hey, you ask me to tow a line, I'll tow a line. Yeah. Allie. Yeah. You know what I'm going to get line. into next week? Some Potang, <laughs> Potang Island. <laughs> yeah. Punani Island, I love it. I think that's what we're going to rename Australia when we buy it, right? Punani Island. <laughs> I don't see why not. Sorry. We are now the country, the island, the independent island, I squared, of Punani. <laughs> Welcome to Punani. We are the I squared of Punani. It's not bad. People over there will go for it. And our flag is just a gaping vagina. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> a gaping vagina. <laughs> what? Well, party Island. Sorry. I'll tone it down. Party Island. Party Island. Right? Yeah. And our flag is just the emoji of the uh, fucking... What's the uh, the confetti thing? No, what's the, uh, the 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 emoji of the purple? The eggplant. The oh. eggplant. There, thank you. Just the eggplant. That's a, it's a white flag with a purple eggplant. It's our flag. You yeah. flip it over the backside, just like the water drops. <laughs> I think one of the things that I'm excited for, yeah, excited to get into next week that I didn't know, and I think a lot of people maybe not don't know is how that Sarah Keller and Nadio, what did we say her last name was? Marchinko. Marchinko. Yeah. Uh, how involved they are. That was what shocked me the other night when I texted you guys. I was like, wait, how aren't these women in prison? Like, no. how didn't that happen? So it'll be interesting. Well, that's a good to. teaser. Yeah. Damn. All right, we got some Patreon shout outs. Uh, I have a couple make goods. Uh, I think we might have missed these ones the first time around. I'm not sure. I can't remember. It's been a little bit. Angela Danger McKenzie. Thank you very much. And Airbus Airbus 29. Um, I think those were the ones we owed some make goods to. Thank you very much. We appreciate your support. New patrons, Tito Dudes, Joshua Holbrook, Crime Trucker, Via, Robin Haas, Trunks, Amanda, Andrew Walwork, Petrie Parkin Parkinen, DeBear5459, Lisa Dickow, Stephanie, Texas Beard 1992, Tom Emerton, Jason Christensen, Rain Not a Bow, Cassandra Voigt, Lana Hazelwood, John, Jackie Kluge, Amber, Courtney Whitaker, Bear Snack, Ariana Gonzalez, Becky Skeleton, Mike's Krusty Sock. <laughs> I think got a lot of work, I bet. Chandler. I bet his Hulk Hogan action figure like was in a Royal Rumble with his Krusty Sock. You know what's really weird is when you said that, the first thing that came to mind is there was a Hogan figure that its shape was like, he was figured like this. <laughs> And then you can pull it apart and it would snap. <laughs> <laughs> but like it was made for like, you know. Fitting around your penis? Maybe. I mean, I wouldn't know, but maybe. <laughs> Pineapple pizza is best pizza. You can get the fuck out of here and hit unsubscribe right now. <laughs> Amber Rosenstein. 
Michelle Kritz, Michael Sanchez, Casey Wonders, Joshua McCowick, Pedro, Kelsey Dexter, Cheyenne Davis, Daniel Bajorvik, or I'm sorry, Daniel Bajorvik, Mikey Porter, Amanda Kay, Stephen Arsenal, Joshua Kurska, Ashland M. Robertson, Sacred Spines Nursery and Apothecary, Angela Williams, Chris Hasha, Stephanie Benson, Sway Zela, Andrea Pavon, Caitlin Thompson, John Hammer, Corey Roberts, Kelly Bard, Jake Carnavali, Ella Ellis, Faith, I Love Whitney 5522, Stephanie McDonald, Jake, Spencer Nicole, Zach M, Bradley, Will Korb, Chance Malone, Mary Chang, Raylene Lara, Lara, Barbie Road, Aaron Mauricio, Amanda Holcomb, Dalton Bradley, and Maria. Thank you all very much. We appreciate your support. Patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Hey, what about Puthy Lips? <laughs> oh, we always love some Puthy Lips. <laughs> uh, Dave, you got anything? I got nothing. Ian, what do you got? For iTunes, I have one for Jen Nugent, Valjoy Kentucky, Mim, Rogaro 92, Wyatt, Kylie Mack, Han, Brittany C23, CXMXA, BB Cole 80, and Chandler Evelry 1. Thank you guys. Oh, fuck. Chandler, Chandler Everly 1. And, and no quicksy. Thank you guys for the awesome reviews. God damn it. You got this over there, Pally? Or? <laughs> I, I think that first one is New Yen, by the way. What Not was New it? Jin. New Yen? New Yen. New Yen. I think it's Yen. Vietnamese. Uh, okay. New Yen. Yeah. All right. We got anything else? Uh, I don't know. No. Amazon.com. Search Necronomapod for all of our merch. We have a ton of new stuff up there, so go check it out. Uh, just about every logo we have is available in T-shirts, premium or regular, uh, female, I think, T-shirts, right? Tank tops. Oh, yeah. Mm. Men and women's tank tops. We also have long sleeves, crew neck sweatshirts, hoodies, thongs. No thongs? No. Th- no. Wow. God mm. damn it. Mm. Uh, the CPS clip positioning system still sold out. I don't know when that's going to really? be available. Mm. Yeah. I'm working on something new, actually. Okay. Yeah. Good. Just wait for that one. Uh, check us out. Amazon.com. Search Necronomapod. And then Necronomapod.com. And uh, we got all of our links to our official social media pages uh, tagged there. So check us out. Thanks very much. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Cheers. Cheers.